After several years in the Amazon, we felt led to the outback of northeast Brazil, the Sertão, which is a whole region that is strongly Catholic and has little evangelical influence. So in 2014, we moved to Arco Verde to work with ABWE colleagues Roger and Marcy Smith, where their Hasifi based church was planting a resource center and church that would serve as a base to reach other cities in the Sertão. The past several years have been full of activities in which we've tried to get to know people in the community. Through park trips, English, American football, cheerleading, we were able to start Bible studies that eventually led to the church plant. In November of 2017, we started using the building for a resource center as well as a church building. In April of 2018, we had the official inauguration. We had a bus and several cars come from Hasifi to celebrate with us, as well as a lot of friends that we had made that, that were from Arco Verde. <laughs> Since the opening of the church building, we have sought ways for people to enter the building and to introduce them to our people. We have held graduation parties, baby showers, birthdays, Christmas parties, other holiday parties, sports events, kids day events, neighborhood meetings, park days, English events, training events and a couple special talks on topics like suicide and even one addressed to the police force. A highlight has been the women's group who we've held bi-weekly prayer meetings and even did an all-day women's event. These prayer meetings have been incredible just for each of us to have a time to share our prayer requests with each other as well as things God's doing in our lives. Also, um, we get to pray for each other, and every single time, once it's over, we leave so uplifted, so blessed, and we cannot wait for the next one. So these meetings have been core to our church growth. We have implemented our servant leaders training course as well. Our students have been faithful and have been growing. The name of our church is Koinonia, which is Greek for fellowship. We enjoy fellowship at the church, to say the least, but we also go other places as well. We have a friend at a local ice cream place we like to go to, and one time our group went to a situ, which is a like a farm, a small farm or a home away from home, and we spent the day in fellowship together. As we plant the church in Arco Verde, we are also active in reaching out to other places. We have had a Bible study in Tupanatinga, a town that is about an hour away from Arco Verde, for the last two to three years. We are currently evaluating how to move this Bible study into a, a church. So we are looking for property to either build on or a place to rent so we can continue uh, to hold the Bible study in the form of services. We have a good group of faithful attendees already. So as we travel for furlough, we will be raising money for the church in Tupanatinga as well as money for a new car. Praise the Lord for all that he's done and will do. And thank you all so much for your faithful prayer and support as we make disciples in the Sertão of Brazil.
All right. Well, yeah, I. You know, we watch that video quite a bit, and it's kind of hard because we miss them so much down there. Uh, praise the Lord, they're they're doing great. Uh, they're they're serving the Lord. You know, this last year we inaugurated, and this last year we had our first. What's up there? What's that picture? No, no, that was right. You can go back to that photo. It's a missions conference. We had our first missions conference in our first year. Why? Because mission, it's all about missions. Uh, it's all about worship. It's all about the nation's worshiping. I've loved hearing all the music in, in Spanish uh, or different languages this week. It, it's awesome because uh, we're missionaries, so all the nations will worship God. And one day we're all going to worship together, and it's going to be awesome. And maybe we'll even understand those other languages, you know? And uh, so we had, look at this. Uh, this is uh, Mateus. He's hilarious. You like that pose? See that pose there? That's funny. You guys can laugh at that. He's a hilarious kid. Uh, we, our church got a kick out of that, but uh, we just love our kids and, and uh, we, we love missions. We, we really want to make that a focal point uh, in the church uh, right alongside food and fellowship, right? Uh, you got to have our food. So that's at the missions conference. Uh, we got, had food made from all different countries. I uh, don't know if you guys have ever uh, done that when my church in Michigan growing up uh, did that. Oh, and I forgot, my, my mom is here from Michigan. She flew in. Uh, actually, she flew in to do her first kind of snowbird trip, right? So she's been in Tampa for February, and so she drove down. Uh, she doesn't like missing opportunities to see the grandkids, so uh, she's here, uh, and it's always good to see her. Uh, here's uh, Sarah with the women's ministry in the church that is doing awesome things right now. The women love going to it. They do a bi-weekly prayer meeting where they just get together, share with one another, and, and grow, and then uh, really have a good focus time on prayer. They have a, a texting group, WhatsApp group, uh, that is very active. I don't look at it because, you know, I'm afraid of what I'll see probably, but uh, it's very active, I know that, and it, because they are, are caring for each other, they're living life together, they're growing together, and it's just been awesome to see. This is uh, one event that they did, and uh, they kind of did a, a big all-day event, and then all the ladies are like, let's do this every month, <laughs> it's like, ah, <laughs> but because they loved it so much, and uh, here's a uh, uh, the, the slide before, uh, one person in there is Cindy. She's a friend from Chattanooga, just enjoys doing uh, women's ministry at her church, came down and did it for us. Her husband is, is on the Chattanooga police force. He's on the SWAT team. And so we were able to get into the police station at where he talked about... Um, about the SWAT team, what that's like, and was able to share about Christ as well. We also did an activity at our church because all my friends were like, well, I want to hear. Let me go to the police station. I'm like, I can't invite you to the police station. <laughs> they invited me, but we'll do something at the church. So we got lots of, I think we had 40, 45 people there, and most weren't from our church, just people coming in to hear about that. That was an awesome event. Pray for Jeremiah uh, the Chattanooga Police Force, uh, they, they had someone, uh, they had to bury someone today from the, from the force. Uh, and Jeremiah ha has a ministry there with, with the policemen. And, you know, that's one thing. We're trying to get Jeremiah to come down to Brazil more and, and do more. But he has his mission field uh, there in Chattanooga with the police force, has a lot of influence there. And I know that you guys, uh, when you think about missions, uh, don't just think about uh, the missionaries you see every year, or I know pastor brings them in uh, during the year as well, but think about yourselves too. What, what is your mission, where you're at, uh, in, in your workforce, uh, in school? Uh, have a mission. Uh, reach out to others. Make disciples. Uh, you, we can do that together. We, uh, missions is for all of us. Um, 
And that's something I've been encouraged about Jeremiah doing that. Uh, here's our, our training program, uh, Servant Leaders. This is uh, Cam Wolford. He's the director for Servant Leaders. He came down and uh, taught a class. And then we did uh, my colleague, Dan Cook, uh, taught Good Soil uh, down there as well. And so we we're using the building for training. Uh, uh, it's, it's not just, you know, for church, uh, which is great, of course, but we want to train and raise up leaders uh, so that we can reach out. Uh, like William, uh, William and Nevia spent four years in South Africa as missionaries. Now they're, now they're with us, helping with uh, worship, but also helping uh, with uh, planting other churches. So what we have here is, is a map. Uh, Pastor Matt talked about the cities, uh, reaching the cities and, and the importance in how Paul reached out. And we have that same mentality. Arco Vergi is called the gate, gateway to the Sertão or the Portal do, do Sertão, uh, which you have to go through Arco Vergi to get to these other cities. So you can see all these cities around Arco Vergi uh, and, and they need churches as well. And so we're reaching out uh, right now uh, the first couple that got saved and baptized, we're so excited about, and uh, they're from Tupanatinga, and they moved back to Tupanatinga. You know, you, you work hard, and, you, and a couple gets saved, and you're like, yes, and then they move away, and it's like, no. I, I don't know if that's ever happened to you guys, or if the missionaries can relate, but that happens all the time, at least in Brazil, all the time. But they went back to Tupanatinga, so we followed them there. And we, did, we started uh, Bible studies there. We, were, we went once a month and moved to every other week. On uh, Tuesday nights, we were going doing a Bible study there. And now we have a core group, and we're ready uh, to... Uh, we're, we basically meet in living rooms. So the living room is about this size of the, the platform, this, this corner right here. So we have 12, 12 or so in that room. Sometimes people have to sit on the floor. Uh, and so we don't have a whole lot of room to grow. So we're now looking at taking the next step, uh, whether it be uh, getting some land or building or renting a building that's, that, that we can use, but something that we can start services in. So pray for that. Uh, that's Tupanatinga. We're, we're excited about that, that, that God kind of, you know, placed it in our, in our laps before we you know, the Arco Verde church plant's been around for uh, uh, a few years, Bible study, but just inaugurated last April. So it's not by any means an established church, but uh, God is sending other areas. And uh, here's Evelyn. She, she uh, plays her ukulele every once in a while there. It's really neat to see uh, her learning that um, and the people worshiping. And so besides Tupanatinga, uh, God, I, I talked a little bit about football on Sunday night. God, God let us have a football team uh, for a few years. It's still going on, but I'm not coaching anymore. But uh, through that, we have lots of contacts. Uh, we have players from Buiki, uh, Pedra, Pesquera, uh, another one up here, São José do Egito, uh, we had a couple that got saved and baptized, and they're now in Seha Taliyah. Uh, it's two hours away, so we haven't really gone there yet, but it's God uh, placing these areas for the future, for future church plants, so pray about that. But uh, here in Pesqueda, my defensive coordinator, uh, Wilker, he lives there with his family. He's got two kids, one on the way. Uh, he's not saved. Uh, he's never been in church, uh, but he, we, do, we do Facebook Live, and I've seen him liking, I've seen him on that, watching that, and he's interested. And I said, hey, you're next. Uh, we're we're going to do Bible studies in Pesqueda. And so pray about that for us as we go back. Just like Tup in Tupanatinga, we've been there for two to three years already doing Bible studies. We're going to try to start... Uh, in Pesqueda, uh, have Bible studies for a couple of years before uh, a, a church really develops, but get a core group there. So pray about that. Pray for 
Wilker, he said, I think one thing holding him back is finishing out his house uh, to, to host us. And he, he told me this week or last week, he said, hey, I think I'm going to work on my house this week. And uh, not that we need his house, but that's how we start, in-home in Bible studies. And so uh, just, just pray for Wilker that God would continue to soften his heart. Uh, and uh, pray for us. Uh, we... Uh, we are we are so blessed. We love our life. Uh, God has uh, given us a heart that just loves being in Brazil. Uh, the girls often say we, they're ready to go back to Brazil, which uh, makes us happy. Sarah and I too. And and it's not uh, in, in missions. It's not always that way. You know, coming home uh, can to the U.S. <laughs> Now we kind of have to distinguish what, what's coming home. <laughs> coming home to Brazil or coming home to the U.S. And uh, it's because we, we just love doing that. Uh, you know, sometimes we talk about sacrifice and missions, and, the, and there is sacrifice. My mom's here, so I'll tell you, I, we miss her so much when we're there. Just a ton, right, Mom? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but we love being there, and... and um, we, we thank God, we praise him uh, for that opportunity, and we thank you so much for your partnership in the gospel with us uh, down to Brazil. God bless.
Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Mark, and thank you, Wanda, for your wonderful hospitality. Wanda told me on uh, Saturday when I arrived that I wouldn't miss any meals, and uh, she was right. So I want to thank Dr. and Mrs. Mortensen for the wonderful hospitality. We went to their home on Saturday, had Chinese food, and Sunday afternoon, the Timothean Sunday School class, I want to thank them for the meal they prepared, and Sunday night, Freddie and Joanna Velasco and Adrian and Ana Gonzalez, thank you for preparing our Sunday evening meal. And then Monday, Javier and Paulo Vargas did a wonderful job. Thank you so much for that delicious uh, meat that you cut up for us there, Javier. And Jorge and Maria Rivero with those uh, mouth-watering ribs they, last night. That was amazing. Thank you so much. And then tonight, Ar Arnie and Paulo Barroso. Barroso. Got to roll my R's on that one, right? And Dr. Basilio and Alicia, and I think others may have helped, but you know, one of my favorite foods of all time is platano maduro. Oh my. So that was great. I saw platano maduro. Mm. I got a good friend. When I got saved, I learned about platano maduro. That's right, in, in Manhattan. One of my good friends was from Puerto Rico, and his mother, Mrs. Rivera, cooked some platano maduro. It was good. <coughs> You like that, right? You like, how many of you love platano? You, 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 you like it sweet, right? I like it the sweet kind better myself. But now on the back tables, as you leave tonight, I really want to encourage you to get one of these Faith Promise mission cards. You'll be filling this out, I believe, on Sunday evening to make your Faith Promise commitment. But if you look at this card and read both sides, it really explains exactly what it's all about and what the church is asking of you. You've been doing it for 61 years, so I know you're familiar with it, but pray about it and really ask the Lord what he'd have you to do. And if you have questions, speak to Pastor Mark or uh, one of the pastors, and I know that they will uh, definitely be happy to speak to you about that. So please take your Bibles. Luke chapter 5 this evening, and I want to speak to you on the subject of surrender. And Peter stages to surrender in fishing for men from Luke chapter 5. So we're going to see three different stages that Peter took in his surrender to fish for men here in Luke chapter 5. I'll read with you verses 1 through 11. Why don't we stand together as we read God's Word tonight. Luke chapter 5 verses 1 down to 11. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him, to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. And Simon answering said unto him, no. <laughs> That's basically what he said. He said, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Then he thought about it. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were on the, uh, on the, uh, in the other ship, that they should come help, help them. And they came and filled both the ships. They were begun to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the drought of fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, and please read the rest of the text with me from the end of verse 10, where it begins, fear not, and we'll read verse 10 and 11 together. Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Can you read that with me again? Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all, and followed him. Thank you. You may be seated. Andrew Murray writes that absolute surrender means this. 
It means that as literally as Christ was given up entirely to God, I am to be given up entirely to Christ. Just as entirely and absolutely as Christ gave up His life to do nothing but seek the Father's pleasure and depend on the Father absolutely and entirely, I am to do nothing but to seek the pleasure of Christ. That's a beautiful definition of absolute surrender. I am to do nothing but to seek the pleasure of Christ. So tonight I want to speak to you on this subject of stages to surrender in Peter's life. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would work now, that we would have no will of our own, that we would realize that a successful life is a life that brings pleasure to you, and Lord, that we would all in our hearts and lives today make sure that we're truly surrendered to you, that we would do and go and be all that you'd have us to do and wherever you'd have us to be, that we would do it, oh God, for your sake, for your glory. May we have no will of our own, but may your will be done through me and by me and in me as we put ourselves in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. My heart was touched when I read the life of a young man named William Borden. He was a member of the wealthy Borden family. Of course, they owned the dairy business. And when he finished high school, his family in 1904 gave him a world cruise as a graduation gift. As he saw the world traveling and he went into the Far East and he saw the great need for souls, he became very burdened. And he felt a call to preach the Word of God. And he told his family, I'm going to go and study the Word of God. He was throwing away a life of, of making potentially millions of dollars in the Borden family business. And people told him, you're throwing your life away to be a missionary. So while in school, he penned these words in the back of his Bible that he would live his life with no reserves. And he said also at that time that he had to say always, every time, no to self and yes to Jesus, to live with no reserve. His family pleaded with him to take control of the business. It was floundering, but he insisted on God's call in his life to go to the mission field. When he graduated from Yale, surrendering himself to go to the mission field, he added these next two words in the back of his Bible, no retreat. He would have no reserves and he would have no retreat. On his way to go to China, to bring the gospel there, he stopped in Egypt to study Arabic because he had a burden to reach the Muslims that were actually living in China. So he stopped in Egypt and while there, he contracted cerebral meningitis. And within one month, he was dead. News of his death was broadcast around the world. It's a, it's a famous family. And a wave of, of sorrow swept the world, the nation. And people said, he's thrown his life away. But then they found in his Bible these final two words. No regrets. No regrets. He knew that the Lord had only required of him faithfulness and that is the way he lived his brief life, without reserve and without retreat and without regret, a life of surrender. I'm going to ask you tonight to really ponder and consider and to look in your own heart, have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Do you even remember a time in your life where you have told the Lord, Lord, here am I, I'll do whatever you want me to do, I'll go wherever you want me to go, without reserve, without regret, without retreat. I want to challenge you tonight to truly make sure you're surrendered to Jesus Christ. And if you've never publicly surrendered your life to the Lord, that tonight you would step out of your seat and come forward and you say, here am I, Lord. I don't know what you want me to do. Maybe some of you know what God wants you to do, but maybe some of you don't. Even, either way, if you've never done it publicly, if there's never a time in your life where you know you surrendered your life. In other words, is there a time in your life where you know, you say, I surrendered my life on such and such a time and place? It's not a bad thing to know that. Just like we know the day of our salvation, what about our surrender? 
I remember one time as I was just gotten saved as a college freshman at Clemson University out of drugs and rock and, rock and roll and all of the wickedness of that lifestyle. God was working in my life and I knew he wanted me to preach the word of God. And I went to church that night and I still so clearly remember because I lived in New Jersey, I had a blue Fiat and I would drive it from my home in Creskill, New Jersey and I would go across the George Washington Bridge and I would go uptown a little bit in Manhattan to 205th Street to the Manhattan Bible Church. An evangelist was preaching named Phil Schuler, And I went to church that night and I said, Lord, I know you want me to preach the word of God. And when Phil Schuler gave the message and gave the invitation, it was for full-time Christian service. And I stood in my seat literally shaking. But yet he continued the invitation and he said, somebody needs to come tonight to give their life and surrender their life to serve God. And I knew he was speaking to me. And finally I stepped out of my seat and I publicly came before the church and I told the church, yes, I believe God wants me to preach the word of God. That was in the middle of the summer of 1978. And that was just as a memorable moment for me as my salvation. And I've never doubted from that day until now that God has called me to preach the Word of God. So I'm going to ask if there's anyone here tonight who's never done that, that you would do that this evening as we consider these stages of Peter's service. The first thing we want to look at tonight in this text is Peter's selfish service. Really, as we begin this passage of Scripture, Peter's kind of looking at, like, what's, it, what a, what's in it for me is kind of how I look at this. Now, as we come into this text, I believe that Peter has already left his nets once. That's in Mark chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 4 when, when he left his nets, when Jesus said, come after me and I will make you to become fishers of men. I believe that's already happened and a number of things has already happened between Peter and Jesus. And P Peter has been obeying and following the Lord. But now as, as it, it comes to this time in his life, Peter probably thinks back to the good old days of fishing. He has seen Jesus do great things up at this po point in his life. He has seen Jesus turn the water to wine. He has seen demons cast out. He has seen the sick healed. He has seen his mother-in-law healed. But then somehow that old craving, that old itch got in him, and he woke up, maybe got a little nap in the afternoon, and then went out all night. He says, I gotta spend a night fishing. Come on, James, come on, John. And by the way, we got bills to pay, guys, and, and so we, we're going to go fishing. And I can imagine them going fishing that night, and, and they were probably thinking, Lord, you've got to bless our fishing tonight because we've been following Jesus. We've been sacrificing for you, Lord, so bless our fishing tonight. So they throw their nets out. Lord, we've got bills to pay. We've been, we've been giving so much time to you, Lord. Take care of us now. They put the net down. Nothing. All night long, they kept praying. Lord, come on, Lord, you've been, we've been giving ourselves to you. Get, they threw the nets out again and again all night not even one fish the night was over the sun began to peek over the horizon don't you think they were discouraged you've got you, you ever have a day no fish you had all this expectation and so they were licking their wounds and peter's over there discouraged maybe he's worried maybe he's thinking man how am i going to pay these bills and he's thinking about his problems and Jesus comes and a crowd gathers. And we see Peter and kind of doing selfish service. He's off to the side, washing his nets. But notice the crowd. The multitude is hungry for the word of God in verse 1. Notice that. It says the people pressed upon him, upon Jesus to hear the Word of God. They were craving the Word. There was an urgency. There was an urgency in them to hear the Word. They were, they were excited. Jesus is here. Je hey guys, Jesus is here. And the multitude all came and they were pressing upon Jesus so that he was even being pushed into the water. They were so excited. But where's Peter? Is Peter excited that Jesus is preaching the sermon? He's over here washing his nets. Peter's Peter's got other things on his mind at this point. And while the multitude is hungry for the Word of God, Peter is distracted from the Word in verse 2, where it says, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them. 
and they were washing their nets. So what, do, do you see that picture? While, while the others were hungry for the word, Peter was like, uh, Peter, Peter was probably thinking, I already heard that sermon. I already heard Jesus say that. You know, maybe they were getting accustomed to being with Jesus. They had, I, I believe in a sense here, that Peter was tired from working all night. He was discouraged from not catching anything. Maybe he was worried about financial problems in his life because he didn't catch it. That was, his, that was his livelihood. And so Peter was thinking about his own situation, his own problems, and being tired and discouraged and worried, he was distracted from Jesus Christ. And he was thinking about himself, selfish, and he was just over here washing his nets. And he was distracted from the Word of God. He had lost his sense of awe in Jesus. He had become accustomed to the miracles that Jesus was doing. And so now vain distractions were creeping into his life, keeping him from hearing the word of God. And I ask myself, what are my nets that distract me from hearing the word of God? What are your nets? What are your nets that cause you to lose your sense of wonder of Jesus? Lose your sense of awe of the glory of his person. What are your nets that cause you to lose your focus on his eternal word and get you overcome with just earthly and temporal things and you you start thinking about all of your worries and all of your preoccupations and all of your own obsessions and the list could be so long. So many things can distract us from Jesus and his word. Am I right? From cell phones to websites, from jobs to houses and cars and boats and sports and games and movies and the heat and the Miami Dolphins. That would be distracting. And my Jets, they're very distracting. They're so bad up there in New York. Now they have the Miami Dolphin football coach. That's even worse. But so many things can distract us. Boyfriends and girlfriends and politics and causes. And we're over here with our nets over here and, and we're not focused on Jesus preaching the word of God. What a picture. Here's Peter, the God called disciple. He's already left his nets. He's followed the Lord, but he's back to his nets and he's not, he's not even seeing what's going on very much. Distracted. I think young people in a Christian school, how many young people are here tonight who come to the school here? You know, uh, thank you for being here tonight. When, when I was saved, I had never been to a Christian school in my life. I had been born, raised, unsaved kid, public school my whole life. And, you know, I was, I was saved at a at Clemson University, a secular school. And honestly, my teachers at, at Clemson, they didn't care whether I came to class or not. They didn't care whether I passed or failed. They didn't care about me. And I saw such a huge change between the, a secular school and then when I went to a Christian college, my teachers prayed for me and they cared for me. And to this day, they know me and pray for me. Some of my teachers, they're, they're my brothers and sisters in the same family. And it's that kind of a relationship. But anyway... I remember when I first started going to Bob Jones, one of the ladies who was instrumental in my salvation, she said, Matt, be careful because a Christian school will be the easiest place for you to backslide. Because you'll be in a, in a place where the Word of God permeates everything you do and, and you can become so accustomed to it, you can lose your sense of the glory of God, a sense of the awe and wonder of our salvation. When you, just, when you hear even the gospel over and over, people can develop hard hearts. Oh yeah, I already know that. I've already heard that. And she said that the Christian school is one of the easiest places to backslide. And then I remember as a, as a young Christian, I was, you know, I was c- coming out of drugs and all this. I was on fire for God. I was reading my Bible every day. I wanted to read my Bible. And, and I remember one of my roommates said, why do you read your Bible all the time? That's what he actually said to me in a Christian school. I said, because I want to read the whole Bible. I hadn't read the whole of it. I said, I want to read the whole Bible. You know what he then told me? He said, oh, you'll get tired of it after a while. Praise God. That was in 1978. How many years is that? 41 years? I'm not tired of God's word yet. I still have a hunger and thirst for his word. His word is unsearchable riches. 
So I say to you, don't let the things of this world, and we can all get distracted, and I confess I've gone through periods of my life where I've gotten distracted from things of the things of God, but we need to give ourselves to the Lord. And I think of this verse, as Samuel told Israel of old, turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Turn not aside, for then should you go after what? Vain things. They cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. And so Peter was washing his nets. Those are the vain things for him. The vain things for us is social media and, and the, the cell phones and all these other things that we could get wrapped up in. While there's a multitude of hungry souls pushing on Jesus to hear the word. So here I see Peter in his selfish service. The multitude hungry for the word, Peter distracted, but Jesus wise as the living word. Because, do you know what? Jesus knew exactly where Peter had been all night. Didn't he? And he knew exactly how many fish Peter caught. He knew. He knew he didn't catch any. And so Peter, or Jesus, so wise, he gets Peter's attention and his involvement. How? In verse 3, it says he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's. Do you think that was a mistake? He didn't get in James and John's fish uh, boat. He got in Peter's boat. Why? Well, what if I just went out here and just opened the, the door of your car and sat in it? Oh, nice car. I just sat in your car. And, and, and I, had, I had hijacked your key, and I pushed the button. Of, you know, it's, not, well, it's one of these nice cars. Forget the key. You don't need the key to turn it on. You just need the key to push the button. You know, you, you'd be, I'd get your attention if I sat in your car and started it up, you know. So here's Jesus. He goes and he sits in Simon Peter's boat. And then he says, hey, Simon, push me out a little bit. Now Peter's really going to watch. He doesn't want Jesus to go out too far. Something happened to his ship. So Jesus is getting Peter's attention because Peter is being selfish in his service. That's the first stage. The second stage is this. And we're kind of off the screen there, but that should say Peter's skeptical service. So the first point was Peter's selfish service. The second point here we see is Peter's skeptical service because the Lord then finishes his message from the ship. And then when he was done speaking, he says to Peter in verse 4, Now launch out into the deep and lay down your nets for a drought. Now, Peter did not like hearing those words. Go not Because Jesus is saying, I want you to fish again. You didn't catch anything? I want you to go fish again. And I want you to launch out into the deep. Peter's thinking, I don't want to go out into the deep. We were there last night. That, that, takes, that takes a lot of time to go out there. I'm tired, I fished all night. And then he says, I want you to let down your nets and notice the plural S at the end of net, nets. And I want you to put, put down your nets. Peter had just spent time doing what? Washing the nets. So if he did that again, he'd have to come back and what would he have to do? Wash his nets again. And so Peter had to really be all in and exert a whole lot of energy to fulfill this command to go into the water, but not the shallow water, into the deep, to go put down his nets, not just one of them, but many of them. And so Peter was not in the mood. Have you ever just been, hey, leave me alone? You know, I'm not in the mood for anybody to tell me to do anything, right? How many of you ever been there? Are you there? You, you hear me out? I know young people are sometimes, come on, mom, I don't want to do that. I just want to sit here and relax, you know? So Peter wasn't really in the mood. He had expended much energy all night, and he was tired. And so Peter tells the Lord that. Hey, we've been working all night. Now, who was the expert fisherman between Peter and Jesus? Peter. Jesus is telling the expert how to do his job. Jesus wants to be Lord of the area where Peter probably thought, I know more than you on this. <laughs> what area do you know more than Jesus does? <laughs> no area. Even the area you think you're an expert in. Peter says to the Lord, we've toiled all night. We've taken nothing. The point is, Peter knew when the right time to go fishing was, which was in the night. And he knew the right place to go in the night, which was into the deep and to lay, let down your nets. And so Peter is arguing, Lord, 
if we didn't catch any fish when the fish are biting or when you can catch the fish in the nets, in the night, in the dark, when they don't see the nets, that's when you go fishing. How are we gonna get any fish in that right now in the day? That doesn't make any sense, Lord, come on. I know better than you. I mean, that's basically what he, well, this is where Peter's competent. So he kind of, he's arguing with the Lord. But then he says, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down, he's a little stubborn now, I will let down what? The net. One net. I will let down one net. But still he says at thy word. At thy word. I want you to mark those words in your Bible, please. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And those three little words of obedience, to obey Jesus, to obey the word, is the supreme rule of the Christian life to obey the Lord. Sometimes we don't feel like doing what the Lord wants to, us to do, but nevertheless, Lord, at thy word, I will obey you. That's surrender. When the Lord tells you to do something that runs contrary to what you think is the right thing to do, but if God says to do it in his word, nevertheless, at thy word, I will obey you, Lord. So sometimes God's word runs contrary to what our friends are doing, to what our loved ones to what the, the culture's doing, but we will obey the Lord. Nevertheless, at thy word. That's a great motto for the Christian life. So I say, husbands, love your wife because God says so. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will love my wife. Husbands should say, wives should submit themselves to your husband. The culture says, come on, that's, that's old fashioned. No, but the word of God says, wives submit yourselves to your own husband as to the Lord. Nevertheless, at thy word, wives should say, I will submit. And children should say, I will obey my parents in the Lord for this is right. And we all should say, I will pray without ceasing even though I know my prayer life is lacking and sometimes weak. But nevertheless, at thy word, I will pray. And sometimes we need to get back into the word of God. God. Sometimes you, you've distracted and put the Bible off, off to the side, but God says we should search the scriptures daily and that his word should be the delight of our life moment by moment. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'm gonna get into the word of God. At thy word. And I will be a witness for Jesus Christ at thy word because souls need Christ. This is his skeptical service. He's still not sure. <laughs> Nevertheless, okay. So we see a selfish service, that's his first stage. Skeptical service, that's his second stage. And his third stage is his surrender. After he argues with the Lord, he obeys, maybe a little bit reluctantly. He cast in, it just says, I'll let down the net. Isn't that interesting? And then we see his surrendered service. Because when they let down the net, what happened? The net broke. How come? Because he didn't let down the nets. In other words, all the fish overwhelmed one net. If Peter had let down his nets, I don't think the nets would have broken. Because then there would have been more than one net to catch the fish. But because he didn't obey, now he has even more work to do. He's got to mend the broken nets. But nevertheless, Peter's astonished at this because he didn't expect this great catch of fish. And so we see two things as we see Peter's surrendered service. We see, first of all, his confession in verse 8. And he confesses, Lord, I am a sinful man. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He confesses his own personal sinfulness and that Jesus Christ is Lord even over every part of his life. Isn't that what surrender is? Surrender is, he is Lord, and I am to be his servant. 
Surrender is realizing Christ is in me and I am to yield all the body parts of my life for him to use for his glory. Surrender is I have no will of my own. Surrender is realizing my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit of God and now Christ is in me and I am not my own. Surrender is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Surrender is one thing have I desired of the Lord and I will give all my life to him to seek after him and to behold his beauty. Surrender is choose you this day whom you will serve. Peter confesses I'm a sinful man. And then we see secondly here his commission because Peter's surrender follows with a commission and I want us to notice this because here's a great catch of fish. Hey, Peter's thinking first, I could pay my bills. I can even maybe pay more bills than I had thought I could pay. I could, I could get out of debt over here in this other debt I had. I didn't think I, didn't think I could. Hey, whoa, whoa, a big catch. My financial problems have, have just eased. But it says here when he surrendered to the Lord, what are the two words Jesus said? Fear not. I'm going to take care of you. Fear not your worries. Fear not your anxieties. I remember when I was in the ninth grade, I was in a, uh, I was in a very liberal church. And my mother said to me, though, because I, I never liked going to church, but when I was in the ninth grade, I was in this confirmation class, and I was somehow enjoying it more than any other Sunday school class. And my mother said to me one time, Matthew, maybe one day you'd like to be a minister. And that scared the daylights out of me. I, I, I always thought that would be the, mo- that would be the scariest thing, to, to be a preacher. It was like, what do you say all the time? You're gonna run out of things to say. And that, that scared me. So Jesus says, fear not. Don't be afraid. From henceforth thou shalt catch men to be a fisher of men. And then it says, When they brought their ships to land, they forsook all. They left the fish right there. Somebody else made the profits from it. They forsook all. And Jesus said this though, again, fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you think Peter remembered that the rest of his life? I think he did. From henceforth, as a turning point, Turning point time. And maybe tonight, this is your turning point. This is your night to say, here am I, Lord. I surrender my life without reserve, without retreat, without regret. I want to surrender my all to you. And tonight will be a night that I will remember the rest of my life as a time when I said, yes, Lord, here am I. 